Right. Good morning. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I did a um, presentation similar to this uh, last year here. Is there anybody who's, who has seen that one? Great. So don't tell anybody that I'm repeating myself. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, the point is um, not much of, of the concept uh, changed for you. It's probably interesting to uh, get an update. But let's zoom out first. Um, free software on, uh, on consumer devices. So uh, when the KDE project, uh, project started, um, I, let's say 15, 16 years ago, um, the idea was to create a unified experience on uh, desktop computers. Soon after that, it became laptop computers. And a long, long time after that, it became also smartphones, tablets, and media centers. But where are the ideas and concepts and values of free software in all this? And I think they're lacking. So, so in a way, the free software community is, or the community in general uh, is finding out that it's not just about laptop and desktop computers, but that more and more of your digital life, of your um, dealing with data, computers, the internet, with all your friends, um, is actually not happening on a desktop computer anymore, not happening on a desktop, but you spread it over a number of devices. And I think the free software community has been, has been sleeping a bit uh, in the past years, especially when, uh, when Apple came up uh, with the iPhone and the, the iPad. Um, Google came up uh, with Android. Don't get me wrong, um, Google is a free software uh, system. Um, the code is mostly licensed under, um, under terms of free software licenses. But very much, uh, so the community needs to, needs to um, create, the desire needs to um, take the first or take the steps uh, to actually bring community values onto consumer devices. So let's um, have a quick look um, at these two guys and think about can these uh, companies deliver the values of the free software community? Apple can't. Don't buy Apple product, uh, products if you uh, value your freedom. Uh, they're evil. I don't think there's, uh, there's much discussion about that. Um, with Google, the situation is a bit more complicated. Um, I said it already, Google licenses most of, uh, most of their code under, uh, under free licenses. And maybe what has been one of our, our best friends uh, is really one of our worst enemies. Because I, uh, I think many people um, consider Android to be good enough in, in terms of freedom. And I don't think it is. Android is not openly uh, developed. You don't get any say in the development uh, process. Um, it's not in the control of the, uh, of the user. The whole system is closely entangled uh, with proprietary services. And there is no equality in, in those who want to use the system. Google decides who gets the source code first, and um, if you don't behave, you won't get the source code before uh, any, of the, uh, any of the other vendors. So, so there's no um, equality. They do fulfill the terms uh, of the license, more or less, but uh, they don't fulfill the thoughts that uh, Stallman had when he wrote down the uh, GPL, and they certainly don't fulfill uh, the concepts and values most of us free software community have. So what we need are, are freedom devices. We need devices that are um, open and hackable. We need devices where there's no single vendor uh, lock-in where you can say, okay, I want to choose this device and I want uh, these people uh, to help me supporting it because I trust them and because they are, um, already, we are already working uh, with them. We also uh, want these devices to be elegant and beautiful. I don't want to, um, to sit on a train and, and be ashamed of that uh, clunky, not well working device while people around me sit there with iPads. Um, well, maybe I would do it, but um, most, of the, most of the people I know would choose fancy over freedom. So we have to do well in, in the fancy department uh, as well. And I think what's, uh, what's really important 
is the user needs to be in control. And that doesn't have to be necessarily an end user, but it can also be a company that wants to, uh, wants to deploy a device or a system um, in their infrastructure. And they actually uh, want to know what's going on with their data. Um, uh, shipping all their emails through Google is uh, for, many, uh, for many companies uh, not an option. So there's both a, both a desire uh, to create a system uh, which, um, uh, which has all these attributes, but there's also a necessity. There's a niche in the market which cannot be fulfilled right now by Apple or Google. Um, so uh, taking a few steps back, in I think around 2004, two, uh, 2005, um, within KDE, um, we started the Plasma project. And um, Plasma was to, uh, to replace um, the existing workspace shell with something more flexible and something that um, can be more easily uh, adapted to a number of use cases. And this uh, number of use cases actually um, uh, doesn't mean only desktop computers, it also um, means different devices and we're, uh, we're about to, uh, to be showing uh, this to our users that we um, haven't actually created a desktop shell per se, but we've created the tools and the components to create, for example, a desktop system. And, well, this is my desk at home. Um, uh, there's no one working, no one ever works at my desk. I only use it to store different uh, devices. So what do we see here? Um, we see my kick-ass huge uh, quad-core workstation with lots of screen space. Uh, we, th we see my laptop, um, which brought us the VGA problems uh, we were just fiddling with. Um, that's also a, um, a tablet uh, sitting there and a phone. And the phone is not running. Uh, Plasma yet, but the other devices uh, are. So um, we've basically taken the step from the desktop uh, to other devices already. And there's more to come, such as this one. So um, more on that later. So Plasma Active, um, about one and a half years ago, um, we looked at, at the whole situation, what um, what are the things we want, and where are we right now, and what are, the, what are the gaps we need to fill in. And so we try to refocus on, um, on our goals. And we created a concept from that that pulls all the pieces uh, we already had together, identifies the, uh, the gaps between them, and uh, starts coming up with a plan how to fill these, how to fill these gaps and um, basically have a complete story how we want uh, to conquer these new oceans. And um, this is roughly what, we, uh, what we've come up with. Uh, first of all, we want to target a spectrum of devices. We don't want to target device A, device B, and device C. <clears throat> we really think that um, you should not think in, um, in different devices, but uh, in a user experience that covers different uh, devices that um, uses one device for one task, another device for another task, but the workflows um, are really happening across those devices. For example, I want to um, answer my emails uh, on a laptop because that uh, types a lot better, um, but I might run into interesting websites all the time and I will save them uh, for later reading on the couch uh, on a tablet, for example. Or um, I see, okay, this is uh, uh, creating this, um, this graphic is becoming a bit too fiddly on the um, mediocre touchpad that's in my laptop. I actually want a um, huge space, uh, workspace, workstation with a mouse um, to work on that. So um, when, we, when we think of what we're doing daily with our computers, it, uh, it is more than uh, one device we really uh, use a number of devices, and those devices are different uh, for every person. But nevertheless, nevertheless they should integrate uh, extremely well. And um, when, I say, when I'm saying extremely well, I want uh, entirely seamless uh, moving uh, between devices. I want to be able uh, to use uh, the same applications with a different uh, user interface. Um, 
I want to be able to use the same kinds of files. I want to be able to have the same metadata. I don't want to think of, I have to copy this file to uh, that device before I move out of uh, the door. Um, a really nice example is actually that I uh, forgot to take my slides um, uh, yesterday for this talk. So um, if the slides are a bit wonky, I needed to uh, rewrite them, so sorry for that. Um, also, we, we have to think of a complete software stack. Um, within many free software communities, um, it is much easier for the developers to focus on one piece of the stack. And um, well, for me, talking to my friends is always a lot easier uh, than walking up to strangers and ask them, asking them questions and trying to come up with uh, solutions with them. So we tend to, uh, to work in a closed group and uh, that is um, especially true in the KDE community being such a, such a big team. Um, so for a long time, uh, we didn't actually talk much uh, to kernel developers, uh, for example, and we absolutely should and we need to. So um, we need to think in terms of the complete stack. We cannot just say, okay, now we are doing the UI layer and we hope that everything else sorts uh, out magically that um, our needs and wishes um, just are being told by, uh, by pink fairies to the kernel developers and everything becomes um, bright and sunny. That is not going to happen. So we need to, um, we need to actively look at the whole stack and not be bound by uh, what is in the close, in, in the Git uh, repositories I already uh, have access to. Of course, the stack should be uh, completely free. Um, I don't want some proprietary uh, middleware in that nobody wants it because it doesn't actually contribute uh, to our goals of creating a complete, uh, completely free uh, system for everybody. We want an open development process. Um, to me, that sounds pretty logical. Uh, as well, when I see a piece of software, I want to be able to hack on it, and when I spend time on it, I don't want this time uh, to get lost. Um, I'm arrogant enough that I think I know better in a lot of situations, and I'm crazy enough to be actually able to put time in and improve things. Without an open development process, this is uh, just completely impossible. So um, we need to look at the whole process, just like we cannot just concentrate on a single part of uh, of the stack, we need to to look at the whole process of creating software, and that starts with uh, with the analysis of what the user actually needs, the design phase, um, of course, the uh, development, the fun part, where you, you know sit down for hours and hack and commit and discuss and review and commit again, um, the deployment part and of course part and uh, the last parts of this process. There's a, a little bit of code but um, there is no way we can just write some piece of software and um, that automatically turns into a consumer device. So here again, we need to, to broaden um, our focus. I already said it, I, I don't want to be ashamed of, of the device I'm using, so uh, we want an elegant UI and as many devices are um, operated by touch screens, but also by other input methods, um, we need to think about touch uh, in our UIs as well. And of course, we need some good reason to convince people to actually use these free devices. So we need unique features, things that other, uh, other competitors cannot deliver. So one of the, uh, one of the uh, central pieces of, um, of Plasma Active is the contour shell, and that is um, actually the, um, who in this room is a bit familiar with KDE's concept of activities? Okay, that's two out of 40,000. Um, KDE's activities are, uh, let's see, right. Um, they are a means, you can uh, maybe think a bit in, in terms of virtual, this way you can uh, collect your, uh, your windows but you can also collect your applications, your files, contacts, bookmarks. So basically, um, all your digital assets, you can group them in certain uh, activities. And that doesn't have to be activity one, two, three, four, five, but those can be mentally modeled uh, um, after how uh, you perceive it. So you could, uh, for example, create an activity for a certain work project uh, you're working on and save uh, emails and contacts that are relevant to that applications you would, uh, you would use with this project, but also files, 
uh, you need for this project and uh, bookmarks um, that are interesting. So the contour shell um, is this concept of activities, but it also contains um, logging what the user uh, is actually doing. It only happens on the, um, on the local machine. So, um, and it's, it's easy to switch off, so there's not really a privacy problem. But by looking at what the user is, uh, is using, we can provide a few features. We can track what the user is doing and um, uh, connect and relate these things uh, to each other and uh, get guess what the user is going, uh, going to do next or what is relevant in the context that the user is doing. Uh, so the workshop um, contains a panel with, uh, with recommendations. It also, um, the same mechanism. So what we actually did for, for the activities is we, um, uh, we patched applications to announce uh, which document they are, uh, they are viewing or what they're doing right now um, on Dbus and we're catching uh, this information and, uh, and tracking it. So um, the shell actually knows what the user is, uh, is watching right now. And um, we developed a, um, a concept that is called Share Like Connect um, that allows generic, um, gen generic app, uh, actions that are relevant uh, uh, to the file you're opening. Uh, right now. So for example, um, say you're reading an ebook, Share Like Connect um, knows uh, which file you're, you're reading or which URL uh, you are reading and it uh, offers options uh, to share these through online services or uh, for example to connect it uh, uh, to your activity. Say you're browsing the web, run into an interesting site, um, you're in your collecting um, collecting articles for this and that project uh, activity, and you can just say, okay, ah, this is an interesting link. You go uh, to Share Like Connect and choose to uh, connect this document or this bookmark to your activity, and um, you get it all in an, in an overview. While we don't want to concentrate um, applications, really, we think uh, that, we, uh, that we can provide a lot of value uh, with a platform, with a system. Um, we do need to uh, think about apps uh, at, some, at some point. Um, to me, apps are really an, an old concept uh, which has um, um, been set up due to necessities of marketing and distribution. Um, traditionally, there was the operator that was sold by Microsoft and there are applications which are sold by uh, third parties and they uh, all wanted to do their own thing, so they didn't actually think much about, uh, about sharing. Um, they needed a clear line between this is the system and these are applications. Um, I don't think the free software community needs that, so we can, um, we can weaken uh, these borders much more. We don't, um, we don't have third party vendors that uh, come over to us and say, yes, but if you integrate a virus scanner in, in your product, we are going to lose market, and that's bad for you again because we actually uh, pay. We don't have these kinds of uh, constraints. We should just uh, work together. But still, you want uh, at some point you'll want some kind of uh, of applications on your um, on your device. So uh, with Plasma Active, we're uh, we're trying uh, to come up with a very consistent set of uh, of basic applications. And we can actually um, take um, a lot from, from existing KDE code bases and adapt them uh, for, um, for use on, on other devices. A really nice example uh, is the Caligra Office uh, suit, which is um, initially built uh, for the desktop, but uh, the input and presentation layer uh, are completely abstracted, so um, the uh, Caligra hackers took it and created a touch-friendly uh, interface from that. Um, likewise for Ocular, um, actually one, one of our uh, developers took the Ocular code base, split out um, the UI Chrome around that and just uh, took the uh, document rendering um, engine of that and uh, built a new UI which was uh, touch friendly 
uh, around it. And within two days, he basically created a highly capable uh, ebook reader which understands literally hundreds of formats, just like uh, Ocular does. And that is wonderful, right? Because you can just take your files from one machine to another and, you, and you'll know they'll be rendered uh, in the same way and uh, you actually have support for, uh, for the same formats across uh, different devices. We um, also come uh, with a lot of um, uh, pre-built complex uh, components. So we offer a quite rich uh, set of libraries and, and development platform. And that, uh, that means that we are often are able to ship an application in a very, very small package, um, uh, non-compiled uh, code. So it's, it's actually a bunch of uh, scripts that uh, use the components native to the platform. And then you can think of uh, theming, uh, translation, um, things like uh, WebKit for rendering web pages, but also uh, the Ocular components which help us uh, to render documents, uh, all the goodness that comes with, with the Caligra suite. Right, and uh, of course they're easy to, uh, easy to distribute. Um, if we can get around to, if we manage to not use compiled code, a lot of problems uh, just vanish. And so I've been uh, working for a while on the uh, on Nokia's N9 phone, and it took me initially about two weeks to get the development uh, set up going so that I, uh, that I could um, write an app on my desktop machine and have it uh, deployed uh, and tested on the phone. And a lot of that uh, has to do that I uh, need to be able to cross-compile on my workstation uh, an application that is going to run on another architecture. Um, these tools have become a lot, uh, a lot better by now, but it's still even better than that is if you don't have to do that. And many web developers are actually used to these workflows where they don't actually have to care about um, pesky details like uh, CPU instructions or that kind of stuff. So um, with, the, with the Plasma platform, we, uh, we're providing um, tools that are so high level that we can actually script uh, most of the complex uh, applications. And if that's not good enough for you, you can still uh, extend your applications using uh, C++, but then obviously you're, uh, you'll have to uh, take another step. Um, we also want to encourage uh, third party applications. So we want to bring more applications uh, to the platform. Um, for that, uh, we've worked out a developer story and we, we've taken concepts from, uh, from user interaction design and applied that to our developer story. Our developer story is basically, what am I going to tell a third party developer uh, who says I would like to um, bring my app uh, to your platform, I would like to work on that. And uh, we have um, actually three persons, uh, three personas for that. The first one is Brian and Brian is a uh, web developer, he has um, a bit of experience with this and that, but um, most importantly he has very bright uh, ideas and he's very good at, um, at coming, up, coming up with something really cool and um, making an application out of that. Brian is not a C++ hacker, but he, he knows his way around scripting and JavaScript and all that. Um, for Brian, we have um, the X Plasmate uh, tool. Um, uh, Plasmate is a workflow-driven uh, tool, which is it's a, uh, it's a very small program. I think it's less than a, uh, the package is less than a megabyte, but it uh, guides you through the whole process of, uh, of creating Plasma add-ons uh, or applications. So you see, uh, in the first step, uh, you get a screen. Okay, this is how you get started. You can create uh, a new one, fill in some metadata. Uh, you press the button, everything is created for you, and and you can uh, start hacking. We uh, even come up uh, with a template. You get a previewer and, and asset management and all that. And in the last step, um, you can export uh, inst or install your, um, uh, your project. And you can even install it directly to, the, uh, to a remote device. And uh, given that it's architecture independent code, uh, it's basically just copying it uh, to the device and making it known uh, to the um, uh, to the app interface on the device. Taking a step um, uh, back, Brian is our first persona. Then we have uh, Luang. Luang has a rather large 
C++-based uh, code base, so she's like a hardcore hacker and she wants to get her stuff on, uh, on the Plasma platform as well. So what's Ryan going to do? Um, her setup uh, is a little bit more complicated. It's just not just installing one app, get hacking and uh, have a lot of fun. Um, so we've worked together uh, with the Mayor project. Mayor is the, the continuation of, uh, of Migo, which uh, was the operating system of choice um, by Nokia and, and Intel. And um, Mare is a, is a really interesting system. It's, um, uh, it's got a few components and you can install it on a device, but you can also install it in a change root uh, environment and it comes uh, with all the tools you need. So, uh, so our approach to this, this more complex use case is, okay, uh, Luang, here's how you install the Mare SDK and it actually has everything you need. It has the cross compiler set up um, it can uh, build native packages uh, in a change root environment, so you get to use all your four cores. And um, it has some scripts pre-installed to get uh, your package onto the device. So um, when I first tried the Mir SDK, I had it set up in 15 minutes, and that's a lot faster than, um, being, than uh, if it took uh, two weeks. So here, I think we've, uh, we've really lowered the entry level for Luang as well. Um, our third persona is not actually that different in technical terms, but um, uh, we decided to include it nevertheless um, because it's a free software hacker who wants to get involved uh, with, uh, with the core team. Um, the tools are, are more or less uh, the same, but on top of that you get um, community infrastructure, you get how, how, how other people can help you with developing uh, applications, how you can get commit access, how decisions uh, are taking, uh, taken within the project. This actually um, reflects the open development process uh, part. So we got that covered. Um, okay, so one, one, of the, um, one of the things that uh, will make um, Windows 8 fail is that it's a system that is not, um, not built for uh, desktops and tablets, but it's a system that has basically two completely uh, different UIs and where it's not quite clear what, um, what the boundaries between the mouse and keyboard driven interface are and, and the tablet uh, interface. Um, my suspicion is that Microsoft does it this way because A, they are too lame and, and they don't know better, and B, they don't actually, um, they are so ar arrogant that they don't need to um, make the users of traditional desktops happy. They say, well, everybody's using it anyway. Um, we have such a firm lock-in uh, on the market that if we just ship a tablet system and make everybody use that and try to converge them in, I don't know, Windows 9 maybe, uh, people will, will still, uh, still eat it. Um, I think that that approach is really wrong. And I think it's actually not that hard uh, to do better. So. Um, Plasma Quick is, um, is our sort of toolkit to create applications that uh, can run on different devices and that make good use um, of the capabilities of these different devices. Um, it uses Plasma as a runtime, so, th so there are lots, uh, lots of components that are already uh, pre-built, um, not only code but also uh, theming, SVG capabilities, uh, you get all the icons and all that, so you don't need to be an artist uh, to create beautiful applications, there's lots of artwork you can reuse. It uses uh, uh, Qt Quick. Um, who, has, who in this room has worked with Qt Quick or has heard about that? Okay, not bad. Um, Qt Quick is a uh, declarative language. You can uh, think of it, um, it's a bit like uh, CSS, but then really, really, really cool. So you can easily create animations. Um, uh, it's very easy to define user interfaces. Uh, that are a lot more flexible than, than boxed buttons and, uh, and frames. But you can also uh, do that. So what we did with, um, uh, with the UI components is we created um, a standard set. Those are called the Plasma components. They are um, actually adaptable uh, to a device. So um, for widgets where it, where it actually makes a uh, different, uh, difference whether you are using them on a touch screen or on a keyboard mouse driven uh, interface, 
they will adapt. And um, a good example is maybe uh, a text box. In a text box, you uh, can just type with your keyboard, and uh, you get Control C and Control Z uh, for copy paste. But um, these these things don't exist on touchscreen interfaces. So on a touchscreen interface, you you might want to uh, press and hold and get a small pop up, and um, this is all done automatically. So just by using uh, these components as your basic uh, widget set, most of your uh, UI concerns are, um, are actually uh, going away. So we're not providing one dumbed down uh, interface that we hope will work on all devices, but we, uh, we create a tool set that is high level uh, enough so that, and that is my experience, about five to 3% uh, of the code actually needs to be um, adapted to the device, and that is mostly dealing with uh, screen size and layout. Um, so in many cases, you would um, you have your project with uh, like 20 source files for all kinds of uh, all different kinds of things, and then uh, you create one layout for a full screen tablet app, one layout for a smartphone app, and one layout um, for say a desktop app, and the rest goes pretty much uh, automatically. And where we, where we are right now. So um, let me just think. Um, Dynamo just said we're short on time. Yeah, let's do the fun part. Um, so two examples. Um, and actually using a Plasma app as desktop widgets. Those are uh, two Plasma apps. Um, one is an RSS news reader. And one is a microblogging applet, uh, which is logged in to my Twitter account. And I'll just quickly show roughly um, how these things work. So yeah, no, no rocket science at all, but see that they're um, interactive and all that. Here's my account. All right. so. Um, uh, these are two apps running um, in the profile of a desktop uh, widget. Now let's have a look at how this would uh, look like uh, on, a, um, on a tablet, for example. I didn't actually bring a device because um, I broke it. Yeah, don't, don't ever lend me hardware. Uh, what's this conference called? Alrighty. So this is the same code base, at least for 95% as, um, uh, as the microblogging application uh, I showed you. And here it's, uh, it's running on a screen with uh, 1024 by 768. So, uh, so you see that you now actually get uh, two columns. You can uh, switch between uh, these columns It behaves similar, but it uses the screen space um, that is available uh, in a different way. It can uh, have more or, or less functionality. See, most of the stuff works except loading uh, avatars. And I've now uh, actually started um, the application with a touch profile, so when I'm uh, pressing and holding uh, the finger. I don't need control C and, uh, and control D, but it becomes possible to, uh, to use the whole thing uh, with touch. So um, uh, those are two examples for A, how we, um, how we adapt the behavior of small components, for example, the text box but also how we uh, change, the, uh, change the whole layout uh, of the application. And let's, of course, also look at the newsreader. And here you see as well that um, the layout uh, is different. Um, the same way the search box um, has this press and hold feature, which is Okay. 
feed reader. All right, um, so what, what we see here is um, I've now actually started uh, the uh, tablet application with a desktop uh, with a keyboard mouse uh, profile instead of, and uh, we can see this in the scroll bar. So here the scroll bar is big enough uh, so that you can actually hit it uh, with your mouse. And getting back to Getting back to this one, you see that the scroll bar is um, it's a lot slower, it's a lot um, thinner, and it's only actually there when you're scrolling. Um, and that is because nobody actually, uh, actually uses the scroll bar itself. It's just an indicator um, on touch screens. And the, the mechanism behind that is uh, we see lots of uh, commented stuff but we also see that I'm exporting uh, a, an environmental tool uh, which is called Plasma, uh, KDE Plasma Components Platform, and I set it to touch. If I set it to desktop, um, it will load a different uh, set of widgets. So um, just by exporting um, whatever profile uh, I'm using in my environment, the applications will just magically uh, adapt themselves. Um, any more? So, okay, so we've got five minutes left. Um, and then questions, right? Yes. Good. So um, I already uh, talked about um, the MIR project. Um, it is, uh, MIR is basically our, um, our proof of concept, our, our reference operating system. So um, we looked at the whole problem space we're facing, and uh, we saw we need uh, to work close, uh, closer with the hardware people. We need to work uh, closer with the kernel people. And um, so we started looking uh, for, these, uh, for these people, and the mayor project not uh, really um, being a very well known to us, a stack and a very cool community of people. Yeah what the fuck, we are just going to do this, people. Um, so we got together, and um, what we're producing uh, right now is uh, basically weekly uh, development snapshots which you can uh, uh, install directly on a number of devices. And uh, so we stopped, um, we stopped stopping at the UI boundaries. We said, okay, we need uh, to get as close as possible uh, to a product and, uh, and um, bring a whole operating system um, uh, gets us closer to that. Also, it makes it a lot easier uh, for uh, for distributions that want to show stuff because we can uh, refer them to a working solution and we don't um, have to go, oh, yeah, I don't know, try this, and no, try that, and just say, okay, uh, uh, look at this, this is, uh, this is how it works. So as upstream developers, we implement uh, one solution and make it very easy, uh, easy to copy. Um, for a lot of devices, we don't actually have uh, suitable kernels, um, but we're badass enough uh, to be able, uh, if Android runs on a device and it has an open bootloader, uh, we should be able to support this, uh, this device as well. And we've done that with a, uh, with a few devices, and uh, it's not without challenges, but um, often we can use an Android kernel, even if we just, uh, even if we just get the binary, Good morning, Henry. Nice to see you. Um, even if we just get um, the binary and the binary drivers, we can um, make this work. Um, it's not what we want. We actually want to see uh, the source code. But let's see. I thought I. Um, we actually want to see the source code, but it's not as easy as that. Um, so our plan was initially, actually, my plan was initially. Um, to be able to, uh, to demo a real device, a tablet. And the idea was that it's going to be this one. It's a seven inch uh, OMAP 4 uh, device. Um, it's not the fanciest hardware in the world, but it's quite nice. It feels solid and everything. Um, so our plan was uh, to be able to ship um, this guy pre-installed um, by the beginning of this summer. 
and we figured we'll just solve other problems that we'll uh, run into. Uh, it's easy enough to tell that we haven't solved all problems that we ran into um, yet. So instead of demoing a cool device and giving lots of them away, um, I can tell you challenges uh, we've run into. Um, first of all, we're very small. Um, selling a few thousand devices is it's just not going to keep anybody who's uh, selling hardware uh, awake at night. So we have, to, um, we have to live with the fact that people aren't actually really interested because we're not going to make a lot of money uh, for them. Of course we do, but they would need the vision to understand what we're doing here right now. And they don't. Um, there's huge uh, cultural divide, um, especially with, uh, with hardware vendors from Southeast Asia. Uh, it's not just a language thing, it's really uh, also a cultural thing. Um, for example, um, if you want to order a few 10,000 of these devices, you don't even need to sign anything. If you just pay and a handshake, and it's completely okay. Those people are not interested in formalities, they're interested in making money. Unfortunately, they're also not interested in compliance uh, with license, and they're also not very interested in understanding uh, what we do and what we need, because we're not making a lot of money for them. So when we, um, um, we actually got a few of these devices, said, okay, um, we tried it and got it working. Um, not the right graphics drivers yet, yet, but the thing booted and with a little bit more work, uh, we were fairly sure, yes, we can completely support all the hardware on that device. So we worked towards that, uh, asked them, okay, can you ship us a uh, few more devices so um, a few more people can work on the device integration and test with all that. They sent us a few more. And it turns out the devices we got in the second uh, charge, they were slightly different. And slightly different means there was completely different hardware uh, in the same plastic casing. So we tried and thing doesn't boot. Why does it, uh, does it not boot? So we uh, again checked Android on it. Android worked, so we uh, reported. Um, oh, actually, no, we, we asked uh, the vendors, okay, um, yeah, we, uh, we are having problems with this one. And um, if we are going to, uh, going to ship these to users, we want to ship the kernel sources uh, with these devices as well. And they said, yeah, well, you can download the kernel source from kernel.org. Yes, we know that, but we want the source that, are, is that, that is actually running on your device, not just, you know, whatever we can download there. Um, silence. Talk again, talk again, talk again. And at some point, um, we actually got a tarball with a kernel source. And no git history or, or that kind of nonsense, but at least we got uh, code um, for a specific kernel version so we got source code, but it wasn't really useful. It re required a lot of work um, uh, to get into that. So, and the device still wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't boot. So we tried moving newer kernel versions. We actually ported um, a bunch of drivers uh, that um, were initially based on Linux 2.6.32 uh, to a newer kernel, found out that the rest of the user space uh, doesn't really work with that, that we needed new power management infrastructure, and I had against the walls, and I think we tried drugs, but that also didn't help. Um, cursing also didn't help, uh, so we're still working on that. Um, uh, we might need to go back, uh, choose different hardware, and, uh, and try again. So in case you're, you're interested uh, why uh, we haven't shipped these yet, um, if you just look at the valley, valley of tears that is flowing through our, uh, through our offices, um, you will get some understanding for that. Um, so it's not really easy. Um, we're still committed uh, to actually achieving this goal to, um, to getting, uh, at, to finding at least one vendor that understands us well enough that things were uh, important enough or doing good enough things so that we can actually get a complete uh, device hardware, um, software completely open, hackable uh, for everybody, uh, their own control onto the market. Um, we're not there yet, it's, it will take a few more sleepless nights, but I hope that before the end of the year we can um, uh, get up a webshop um, with a device that is completely free, that you can just order and it's 
right there open for you to hack on. Um, the animal said I'm done. So I'll leave you uh, with a few links and the opportunity to ask questions. Um, one question regarding the contour shell you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, what kind of recommendations you may want to give to the future? Um, what if, um, um, well, basically, we want to guess your next step. So the, the goal is really um, find out what the user is going to do next and offer that in the primary UI. Um, uh, right now, uh, oh, right. I promise to uh, repeat the question. Um, what kind of recommendations do we want to give in the future? Um, uh, what we can do right now is we, um, uh, we look at what the user is doing right now, what is the current activity, and what are documents that have been uh, opened uh, in the same context. Um, you could also uh, think of uh, we're looking at a document and the system knows, hey, uh, this document has been sent to you uh, by this and that person that you want to reply back to that person. So it's, um, it's really a very high level concept and uh, sky is, is really the limit. Whatever we can uh, make work technically, uh, we will try. Does that answer your question a little bit? A little bit, yes. <laughs> well, uh, is this, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the recomm um, the recommend we don't want the machine to be uh, smarter uh, than you while it isn't. Um, so what we did is um, uh, we have a um, on the uh, tablet we have a panel on the left side you can uh, pull out. So it, it will never get in into your face. You want to do this. You want to do this. Um, it will just sit there. And uh, what we are uh, trying to achieve, we are uh, trying to make it so useful that it will become an automatic part of your workflow. Um, and you see, okay, I'm doing this, and you always find the right things in the panel engine uh, to get in your face to try to be, to try to outsmart uh, yourself. That's, I don't think that's going to work. Any more questions? Because I've got a few more boring slides you may choose. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the uh, really interesting Um, um, what, we, uh, what we can actually uh, do today, um, and that already works on the desktop, is we, um, uh, we can share data sources from one machine across the network. So, um, for example, um, I could run a battery applet on this machine, but I could also say um, I want this applet to appear on that machine. So it will still use the data from uh, this machine, but it also only ships the UI shell uh, over and the data communication is done uh, automatically. Um, that's pretty abstract, and in the case of the battery, it's pretty useless even. Um, uh, but what I'm really excited about is when we uh, release a media center next, um, next year, uh, I want to be able uh, to browse through IMDB uh, on the tablet while I'm uh, watching the movie, uh, hit play, and uh, make it play directly uh, on another device. And um, the interesting thing is that um, the hard parts have already uh, been solved. We, uh, we need to, to solve the UI layer uh, for this now. So um, it's actually not that, com uh, not that complicated uh, anymore, but um, within KDE, we have created this culture of solving the really hard problems and then forgetting about um, actually making it, uh, making it work uh, for the user. And that is one of the things that we are trying to solve with this user-centric uh, approach. We're uh, trying to define use cases we, we want to support really well and track technical uh, problems um, based on that. And does this answer your question? So the question was, um, um, how do we, uh, how far are we in moving applications uh, across 
uh, devices. And part of that is also uh, synchronization uh, of documents, uh, synchronization of meta, synchronization uh, of bookmarks, and uh, that's one of the topics I'm, uh, I'm working on right now. So, working on right now means that um, this is actually a, an early alpha version of the on-cloud synchronization uh, client we're developing right now. Let me just move this out of the way. So here, here you can see that we're uh, also starting um, uh, to uh, implement file synchronization uh, in the desktop. Um, from the amount of people that are working in iGather, we're done. Um, are there any more questions? Um, how, how much? How much luck will I have? If I want a device right now, the kind of device that runs Slackman? Um, you can get an Arcos G9 uh, tablet. That's an um, 8 inch version and a 10 inch version. I think the 8 inch costs 200, 250 uh, euros. Actually, a pretty nice device. Um, and we have uh, ready made images for that. Uh, uh, needs a bit, little bit of um, bias fiddling. Um, what you can uh, uh, order that and use that. Um, it's actually one, one of the devices that uh, is, uh, lies with a broken SSD on uh, the desk I showed uh, earlier. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we do have a couple of devices. Um, obviously, most of the um, Intel x86-based tablets uh, just work, but they're usually a bit too clunky, too heavy. Um, if you can get a first revision of this one, uh, <laughs> That also works. Um, no, it's actually not a card. You can just. Yeah, but this is one of the revisions okay. that won't work. So <laughs> if you're looking for, <laughs> for a cheap Android tablet, you can use this one. Um, now, basically, um, the, what I an open boot kernel uh, that boots us, and we kernel uh, from Android. Uh, so there are a few devices we support right now. At each individually, uh, so it's a limited number of devices we uh, we can support. Um, but hey, you're an operating system dude. You could uh, um, just get a random cool device and make it work, and um, then we'll uh, we'll roll images uh, for that device. Um, I have got to shut up. If you have any more questions, please feel free to approach Sebastian yeah. in private afterwards. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm very receptive to beer. But thanks a lot for, uh, for your attendance and patience. Good. Thank you very much. And next up in this room.